Ready? It's noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everyone, um, for another installment of the White Bar Pine Ecosystem Foundation webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Bob Keane, the Associate Director of the White Bar Pine Ecosystem Foundation and an emeritus research ecologist. Um, he's a research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service at the Rocky Mountain Research Station in, in Missoula Fire Sciences Laboratory. Uh, and his most recent research includes developing ecological computer models for exploring landscape, fire, and climate dynamics, uh, mapping of fuel characteristics, and investigating the ecology and restoration of white bark pine. He's been working in white bark pine ecosystems since 1984 and built one of the first models of white bark pine dynamics in 1990. He's also one of the charter members of the WPF and served as the foundation's treasurer from 2000 to 2004 and as a board member since 2004 until 2016. He's also a member of the U.S. International Association of Landscape Ecologists and the International Association of Wildland Fire. He has a wide variety of skills to the position and board member because of his past experience in that capacity and strong background in white bark pine ecology. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. I want to first thank the organizers of this wonderful webinar series. I, this is the greatest way to get out the latest in White Park Pine research and management activities. And I think this webinar is just exactly what uh, managers and everyone need to understand why White Park Pine is declining and what we can do about it. I will, so thank you, organizers, for that. Today, I've been asked to say a little about uh, the listing. If those of you who don't know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has finally decided to go ahead and uh, on December 14th of 2022, they announced their final action to list white park pine as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. This is a very exciting thing. Uh, most of you probably don't know that the White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation uh, neither supported nor did not support. They were neutral about the whole idea of white bark pine listing because they knew it had both good and bad sides. But once the listing came out, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation is over the moon about it. It validates their effort to have the foundation. It, it indeed tells everyone that White Bark Pine is indeed in trouble. And now we have to put together a great restoration plan so that we can get these ecosystems restored quickly, fast, and uh, for uh, a long time. So uh, I uh, gave or the... If someone could put out the uh, the website uh, in the chat box for for people to get more information on the listing, that would be wonderful. Uh, from here on in, uh, there are people that uh, totally support the listing and people that don't support. And the people that are probably on the fence about the listing are really worried about the fact that uh, whether or not they can do restoration activities that may result in the net loss of whitebark pine at the beginning. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation and the American Forest, have been working together to put together a plan that allows the net take of White Park Pine in order to restore it over the long term. So uh, I don't think there'll be a lot of barriers, and I think this is a wonderful way for uh, White Park Pine to be restored in the future. And with that, I'll give it back to uh, Laurel. Thank you again. Thanks, Bob. And it is also my pleasure to introduce Laurel, today's speaker. Uh, Laurel Sindewald is a PhD candidate in Diana Tombeck's Forest Ecology Lab at CU Denver, where she's completing several research projects on limber pine at Treeline in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, her first paper published in Forests in 2020 described the structure and composition of communities in Rocky Mountain where limber pine is the dominant conifer. She is working on follow-up to that study comparing the structure and composition of randomly selected tree line communities in the park. She's also estimating limber pine seed viability across high elevations, comparing the number and proportion of viable seeds produced by Krumholtz limber pine to those produced by subalpine limber pine within Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, she received funding from the park in 2021 and 2022 to raise any seedlings resulting from this viability research for restoration planting in the Cameron Peak Fire burn area 
Uh, lastly, she is developing a remote sensing applications for species classifications at Treeline, which is what we'll be hearing about today. Uh, Laurel also enjoys trail running for science and for fun. Uh, and she recently signed up for the Bryce Canyon 50 mile ultra marathon as a charity bib, raising money for the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. Uh, you can support her run for the foundation and I will include a link for that in the chat. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Laurel. Thanks so much, Vlad, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Um, I'd also like to thank my collaborators, Ryan Lagerquist, Matt Cross, Ted Scambos, Peter Anthematten, and Diana Tombach for their work and guidance on this project. It's also nice to start a talk with something to celebrate. So congratulations to everyone at White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and its many supporters in getting White Bark Pine listed as, in, listed as endangered under the ESA. I especially want to recognize my advisor, Diana Tombach, whose science and advocacy has led the way, way for decades to understand protect and restore white bark pine ecosystems. Today I'm focused on a closely related conifer that's found a little further south, limber pine, and how we can use remote sensing technologies to estimate its distribution in remote or hard to reach places such as treeline in Rocky Mountain National Park. Limber pine is considered to be a keystone species in Rocky Mountain National Park due to its periodic production of prodigious quantities of nutritionally dense seeds that feed diverse wildlife. It is shade intolerant and slow growing and therefore considered to be a poor competitor. However, it is a drought tolerant and wind tolerant species and can establish on steep slopes in exposed and windy areas where more moisture limited conifers may struggle. Limber pine is also dispersed by the Clark's nutcracker seen here, um, which has been documented traveling up to 32 kilometers before caching harvested seeds. Likely as a result of this behavior, limber pine's distribution in Rocky Mountain National Park and range-wide is patchy and has a metapopulation structure. You may be familiar with the widespread mortality of uh, white bark pine caused by white pine blister rust. Limber pine is also threatened by this disease caused by the invasive non-native fungal pathogen, Cronartium rubicola. It is already listed as endangered in Alberta and is being considered for protection more widely in Canada. Blister rust continues to spread southward and has reached Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, it was first identified in the park in 2010, and as of 2019, over 150 trees were pruned in an attempt to reduce the spore load. The areas that are at highest risk for transmission are valleys and riparian areas where the relative humidity is likely high enough to allow basidiospores to travel from the alternate hosts, primarily species in the genus Ribes, such as wax currant, to white pines where they infect through the stomata of the needles. Surprisingly, though, I discovered blister rust at two treeline sites in 2019, and we have found dozens of new cases this year, including many at treeline. Unfortunately, it has been a bad year for blister rust spread in Rocky Mountain National Park. You can see here this very small tree growing above Jim's Grove and Rocky Mountain National Park has a blister rust infection on its main stem, and this larger tree just down slope has an infection on a lower branch. Treeline sites are important to consider for limber pine conservation because the species is projected to move to higher elevations under changing climate. Monaghan et al. also hypothesized that limber pine's distribution in Rocky Mountain National Park will shrink due to competition at lower elevations. It's important to note, of course, that bioclimatic envelope modeling, which uses climate data for a species' current distribution to estimate its future distribution under novel climate scenarios, does not consider biotic variables such as dispersal, seed viability, mycorrhizal associations, or facilitation. Seedlings also have different niche constraints than adult trees, which can tolerate greater water stress. And so the present locations of limber pine trees might be relictual, which means that they might reflect where seedlings established under past climate rather than the optimal conditions for species in the current climate. So there might be a lag. We have an estimate for limber pines distribution in subalpine forest. Um, as you can see in this map here in Rocky Mountain National Park, but treeline limber pine communities are understudied in the park. To refine climate change predictions for the species, we need to estimate limber pines distribution and relative abundance at treeline and determine which variables are important for its establishment and persistence there. Of course, this is a good opportunity to develop a remote sensing approach because treeline areas are often difficult or even dangerous to access. 
However, the alp alpine treeline ecotone represents a difficult classification problem if we're interested in distinguishing individual tree species. Objects are harder to resolve and classify in satellite imagery when they are smaller, irregular in shape, with lower aspect ratio on a heterogeneous background, and when they are similar in spectral reflectance and shape to other objects. All of these things are true of limber pine at treeline. For example, you can see um, the limber pine Limber pine interspersed with glandular birch, subalpine fir, and Engelmann spruce um, at the Long's Peak study site in the top image. And in the bottom image, you can see that most of the limber pine at treeline um, at the Battle Mountain site is very small, not much larger than one or two square meters in area. And in other treeline areas, the problem is worse. Um, for example, at the Long's Peak study site, looking at Jim's Grove and the Battle Mountain backcountry site, you can see vegetation grows densely, especially around Larkspur Creek. Um, it's a dense mix of two species of willow that hybridize glandular birch, aspen, subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, and limber pine as a minor component. Occasionally, you'll also find common juniper and shrubby sink foil. It's easy to see this is a difficult classification problem. So in order to discriminate tree species at the individual tree or patch level at tree line, we therefore need very high spatial resolution. We also likely need high spectral and radiometric resolution. So spatial resolution is pretty self-explanatory. It's the area of ground an image pixel covers. Ideally, you have multiple pixels for each object you're trying to discriminate. The spectral resolution is a little more abstract. Um, so I've included an image of the visible light spectrum and where it's located on the wider electromagnetic spectrum. The spectrum here is shown as continuous data with measurements represented at every nanometer. However, when you try to sense radiation from space, the amount of radiation that makes it to the sensor is less than what we experience on the ground. And you have to decide whether you want to use all of this radiation to render higher spatial resolution, such as a black and white panchromatic image, or whether you want to sacrifice some spatial resolution and have greater spectral resolution recording irradiance levels in different regions of the spectrum separately. So multispectral data has multiple bands across the visible and near-infrared regions of the spectrum. Um, for example, uh, near-infrared near bands, red band, yellow band, green, blue, et cetera. Hyperspectral data, on the other hand, has hundreds of bands across the spectrum approaching continuous data. You generally need to be closer to the ground to capture enough radiation to resolve hyperspectral data, such as with overflights or drones. Um, although the company Planet is going to be launching a hyperspectral satellite next year, I believe, with a 30 meter spatial with 30 meter spatial resolution, which is pretty amazing. So it has the same spatial resolution as Landsat, but with hyperspectral resolution. Lastly, we have radiometric resolution, which is our ability to distinguish fine differences in radiation intensity. Um, so if we want to distinguish plants, which have very similar reflectance curves, um, if we have high spectral resolution, we can discern differences in the shape of those curves. Um, and if we have high radiometric resolution, we can detect slight differences in how much radiation they reflect in different parts of the spectrum. So Worldview 3 provides a reasonable balance of all of these of these various trade-offs for our application. My collaborators, Matt Cross and Ted Scambos, were successful at discriminating rainforest tree species at the La Selva Research Center in Costa Rica using Worldview 3 data. They published on this work in 2018, and I've cited their papers in my references at the end. The 1.2 meter multispectral data gives us eight band spectral resolution and 11 bit radiometric resolution, which means that each band has 2047 different brightness levels. We also have the 31 centimeter panchromatic data, which is high spatial resolution, black and white image. Lastly, notice the eight shortwave infrared bands or SWIR bands. I'll touch on the potential utility of these at the end of the webinar. <coughs> So, all right, so <clears throat> let's talk about how we went about doing this. So first, you can never escape having some sort of ground truth when doing remote sensing. We collected a hyperspectral ground truth using an ASD field spec pro spectral radiometer. You can see my former field assistant, Lucas Rudisell, holding the fiber optic cable, cable over a patch of Krumholtz limber pine. For our actual collections, we attach the cable to a, a hiking pole in order to hold it around one meter above the subject 
the methodology for the spectrometer collections was fairly involved, so I won't go into more detail now, but please feel free to ask me at the end of the talk or send me an email if you want to learn more. Um, we will ultimate, also ultimately publish on this work, but essentially this provides a collection of continuous reflectance data from 350 to 2500 nanometers without any influence of the surrounding tundra or atmos atmospheric effects. We also delineated around 700 polygons of individual tree species in the field. We ensured all polygons contained only one species and focused most of our collections on individuals isolated from other vegetation patches. On the right, you can see Ryan Lagerquist delineating a patch of subalpine fir. That day we had the benefit of a Zephyr antenna, increasing the horizontal accuracy to about five to 10 centimeters. Though generally we used a Trimble GeoXT or Trimble Geo7X with submeter accuracies. Lastly, we collected ground control points. Ground control points, or GCPs, allow us to get precise GPS locations of points we can discern in the imagery. We use these GCPs to orthorectify the imagery, which basically means we shift pixels to match locations on the ground, correcting for distortions due to the view angle and rugged terrain. Usually, people use things like the corners of intersections, place targets, or other precise markings. The best we could do were trail junctions, switchbacks, and nutshucks or cairns. And you can see this is a switchback with an anakshak um, in this example. <clears throat> Once we had GCPs collected, we could order the imagery from Maxar. This is an example screenshot from Maxar's catalog for our area of interest. You can also see the rough location of the imagery with respect to the rest of Rocky Mount National Park in the top right. We used NV to hand select pixels that fell entirely within tree polygons. We created areas of interest for each species in NV and then exported the reflectance data. Even after orthorectifying the data and in spite of the high horizontal accuracy when we were collecting the polygons, there were slight systematic offsets in the data that you can see here. Where possible, we used the panchromatic data. Um, so that's what's pictured here. Uh, to determine where offsets existed and which pixels should really be included. The shapes of the vegetation patches were especially helpful for this. We converted our hyperspectral ground truth to equivalent Worldview 3 multispectral bands to compare apples to apples to check whether the data collected for a given individual on the ground compares well to the data collected for that individual by the satellite. This is to ensure that our pixel selection process in the imagery was adequate. We can also use this data to determine whether spatial or spectral resolution is more limiting for this classification problem. I'll present this work at the end of the webinar. Finally, we can use our World V3 reflectance data labeled by species to train and validate a convolutional neural network machine learning model. We probably won't have time to go deeply into the structure of this model, but I've included a diagram of the architecture here and I will um, do my best to explain it to you um, simply in upcoming slides. So now we're on to our results and I'll start with an example of the spectrometer data that we used in develop our development of the field methods. Here you can see the reflectance profiles from collected from a single limber pine tree in the field. The world view three bands are shaded in the background. Line A corresponds to panel A, and was a point collection of reflectance for green needles, averaging a circle of approximately 33 centimeters in diameter. Line D uh, was a collection of mostly stems and brown needles and was also a point collection. You can see that especially in the red edge and near infrared regions, the curves, oops, the curves diverge substantially due to the loss of water content in the cells and the loss of chlorophyll in the needles. So we can already tell that variation in the condition of an individual is likely to add intraspecies variation and make it difficult to distinguish between species later. This is particularly an issue at treeline where individuals may be differentially water and wind stressed or damaged by snow and ice. We also collected two canopy averages, <clears throat> moving the fiber optic cable across the tree while keeping the view angle as close to on nadir as possible and one meter above the tree. The canopy averages agree fairly closely. 
When we convert the spectrometer data to worldview three bands, we essentially do a weighted average across the wavelengths collected by the sensor, weighted by the proportion of radiation the sensor is detecting at that wavelength. <clears throat> I used a program in MATLAB written by Matt Cross for, this, for his work with trees in Costa Rica to do this conversion. We can then compare our two canopy averages, bottom lines, to the median worldview three reflectance curve across pixels for that individual, the shaded areas at 95% confidence interval um, bootstrapped um, across the pixels for that individual. And we can see that they agree fairly closely. Although there's a slight difference in the magnitude, likely because the image was taken, the image, the top line was taken in July and the spectrometer data for this comparison was collected in September um, when the illuminate, illumination angle is lower and there's less radiation reaching the ground. It's also easy to see how much information we can lose when we move from hyperspectral data in this slide, see, uh, to multispectral data in this slide. <clears throat> Okay, so this figure provides a visual of all 10 data layers the CNN used for classification, which are called channels in the machine learning literature. Each channel is a predictor in the model. CNNs work on a pixel level, so each pixel is treated as an example of a given class, and information is taken from the surrounding 160 by 160 meter image chips for each channel. The aspect ratio is a little off here for the package used to generate the figure, but this, these are 160 by 160 meters. The slope here is just a visualization of the DEM uh, and was not a separate channel. The patterns you see are likely artifacts from the model or from the interaction process. Okay, <clears throat> so again, I won't have time to give you a full course in neural networks and CNNs here, but I'll try to tell you enough to understand what's going on. Um, a CNN is a form of neural network that is spatially aware detecting patterns in data layers on multiple spatial scales. It can do this because the data is provided in matrices where each element in the matrix represents a data value for, the, for a pixel on the ground. The CNN is structured as a series of convolutional layers, each followed by a pooling layer. In the convolutional layer on the right, the channels A through C, so these could be thought of as worldview three bands, for example, are multiplied by this three-dimensional filter. The weights in this filter are learned during the training process. Then all of the filter elements, once this multiplication has been done, all of the, the resulting elements are summed to create one element of the feature map. So G is the feature map on the right. The filter then moves to the next set of elements um, until all of the um, channel data has been processed. The resulting feature maps can be thought of as exaggerated patterns found across all of the data channels. So after two convolutional layers, the feature map is transformed with a re re leaky ReLU activation function followed by batch normalization. I won't get into details on these steps here, but please feel free to ask me at the end. Um, next, we do a max pooling step where the resolution of the data is reduced by half. So that's what you can see in this GIF here. Um, so as this, this kernel moves across the matrix, um, the, the maximum value for each of the four elements is retained. Um, doing max pooling as opposed to, for example, mean pooling um, helps with, with edge detection and also allows the model to learn, and the pooling in general allows the model to learn at patterns at multiple spatial scales. Um, so after each pooling step, we're looking at patterns on coarser spatial scales. Okay, so now that you have an idea of how convolution and pooling works, we can revisit that CNN architecture diagram. So because the panchromatic data is at 31 centimeter resolution, the first two convolution and pooling layers are done with only the panchromatic data. So remember each con box here is two convolution layers followed by a leaky ReLU activation layer and then batch normalization um, and then max pooling. Once the panchromatic data has been pooled down to the re resolution of the multispectral imagery and the interpolated DEM, these channels were all concatenated. And then after five more rounds of convolution and pooling, the last feature maps are flattened into one vector 
and fed into a dense layer. So this final dense layer, layer is a traditional spatially agnostic neural network and um, uses the softmax activation function, forcing the outputs to range from zero to one and some to exactly one. So we are now <clears throat> converting the information into probability, probabilities and making our classification. The model was validated using five bold cross validation. Okay, so let's look at some results. Here we have an overview of the performance of the six class CNN model. Um, so that's including subalpine fir, glandular birch, Engelmann spruce, limber pine, aspen, and willow. The class frequencies tell us whether or not we have any underrepresented classes in our training data set. Aspen or Poder is definitely underrepresented with a frequency of 0 0.028. Um, Aspen was a minor component in the community where we obtained our tree perimeters. We can see in the confusion matrix that the model never learned to predict Poder. So this is a classic rare event problem in machine learning. A confusion matrix allows us to assess how well a model identifies a given class, as well as which classes are often confused. On the bottom of the matrix, we have our predicted species classes, and the rows here are our observed species. The column normalized confusion matrix is created by dividing each element in the matrix by the total pixels for each column, and is showing us, for a given predicted species, how often each species is observed. In other words, what percentage of our predictions are correct? We can see that abla, or subalpine fir, and piffle, or limber pine, oops, <clears throat> um, had the highest proportion of correct predictions. So 52.7% for limber pine, 55.4% for abla or subalpine fir. Um, <clears throat> Keen or Engelmann spruce was most, or pyan, uh, depending on your preference, was most often confused with subalpine fir um, or limber pine, although it was also confused with just about everything else. Bagel or glandular birch is most often confused with subalpine fir or limber pine. Um, and salix or willow is most often confused with subalpine fir or Engelmann spruce. We can also compare the CNN accuracy to that of a trivial model that predicts probabilistically based on class frequencies. So the best accuracy that model can have is equal to the most abundant class, in this case, ABLA or subalpine fur. The CNN outperforms the trivial model for top one, top two, and top three accuracies, but still has a low overall accuracy of about 43.4%. Top one accuracy is the same as overall accuracy and reports the proportion of predictions where the highest probability class is also the correct class. Top two accuracy reports the proportion of predictions where uh, one of the highest two probability classes was correct. Top three, it's the proportion of predictions where one of the three highest probability classes were, were correct. We can next look at which predictors were most important for model performance. So the Garrity score was the most effective loss function evaluated because it emphasizes lower frequency classes. Um, the loss function is how um, we quantify um, model performance. Um, and so we want to ultimately uh, achieve lower and lower loss function values, um, or at least when the Garrity score is negatively oriented in order to um, achieve the highest accuracy. <clears throat> so what we see in the figure on the right are the results of a permutation test. The single pass forward test is where each variable is permuted or shuffled in turn, preserving data for all other variables to see how permuting each variable affects the loss function. The multi pass forward test takes that the variable from the single pass forward test that was the most influential variable and permutes this variable, assessing the influence on the loss function. Then it permutes both this variable and the next most influential variable, leaving the rest intact and calculating the loss function. This proceeds until all variables have been permuted. The single pass backward test does the inverse of the single pass forward test. All variables start out as permuted. Sorry. Um, all variables start out as permuted, um, except for one variable at a time. <clears throat> 
uh, such as starting with the panchromatic in this case. Um, and the estimated loss function is reported for each case. The multi-pass backward test begins with all variables permuted and then depermutes each variable in the order of importance determined by the single pass backward test, leaving other variables, leaving variables permuted as it goes. So in bold, we can see the variables that were statistically more important than the variable below it. So from this, we can see that the panchromatic and elevation data have the greatest impact on the loss function and therefore the most important or are the most important or informative for the six class CNN model performance. The red, yellow, green, and coastal bands also seem to be important for model performance, but to a lesser degree. So because the sixth class model had such low accuracy, we decided to pool the classes with less data to see if that could improve model performance. We're most interested in separating the conifers and especially limber pine, so we collapsed the data into four classes, subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, limber pine, and other. The accuracy does improve with a top one or global accuracy of 51.6% as compared to a trivial model accuracy of 35.1% and a top two accuracy of 72.9 versus 63.1% for the trivial model. Limber pine emerges as the class with the highest accuracy, followed by subalpine fir and other, um, both of which are have um, greater frequencies than limber pine. Engelmann spruce is um, getting confer confused with subalpine fir, which makes sense given their similarity in morphology and often also color, but is generally getting confused with everything else. The model is not a reliable predictor of Engelmann spruce. <clears throat> the permutation test results are less encouraging if we're hoping to make use of the multispectral imagery. The panchromatic imagery, which remember has 31 centimeter resolution, stands out as the most important pr predictor, followed by elevation. Finally, because we are most interested in discriminating limber pine from other vegetation, we tried a two class model where we pulled the examples from all five of the other classes into other. The results are very hopeful for applying this work um, to limber pine because the accuracy jumps to 85.3%. Although this is not substantially greater, greater than the trivial model, which is 80.3% equal to the frequent, the highest abundant class, the most abundant class. <clears throat> we can also see that more of the data layers, layers provided were useful in this classification. Elevation is no longer an important predictor, but the red, yellow, and blue bands emerge as important predictors. I find these results to be encouraging because it seems less likely that the CNN is zeroing in on idiosyncratic spatial patterns unique to our site and may be using spectral differences between species to do the classification. Of course, we'll know for sure whether the model is overtrained um, when we apply it to the testing data set, which is pend pending further data processing. Okay, so sorry for the text heavy slide. This may only be helpful for folks watching the YouTube video who can pause, but to summarize, the four and six class models do not perform particularly well and rely mostly on the high spatial resolution panchromatic data, ignoring the multispectral data that we hoped would be useful for discriminating species. This may mean that the spatial or spectral resolution is too coarse for this classification task. However, we did see better model performance for the two class model for limber pine, perhaps because of its unique growth form and tendency to form in low, open, low density stands. Of course, applied at a landscape scale, if we are not relying on the spectral data, this could mean that limber pine will be confused with lodgepole pine at other tree line sites. Our next step with this model is to obtain Worldview 3 imagery for the same community, but in September, when deciduous plants will be senescing. We will also obtain eight band Worldview 3 shortwave infrared or SWIR data, and more on this shortly. <clears throat> so we can begin to tease apart the limitations of our remote sensing approach by working with our field spectrometer data set. It's worth noting that to obtain these samples, we generated random points across the study area, excuse me, and collected spectrometer data for the nearest individual of each species to each random point. So um, these individuals are um, about as independent as we could manage. Um, the sample sizes are indicated in the caption. 
They're low because this data is very difficult to obtain at Treeline in July, um, mostly because we um, needed to obtain samples two hours either side of solar noon uh, in order to maximize illumination. Um, and we also required cloud-free skies because as soon as a cloud passes over the sun, it changes the illumination and renders the collection useless. Um, I can explain more about this later, um, but if you're familiar with tree line in July, um, convection tends to happen in the um, in the afternoon, and so often our collection was cut short due to cloud cover. <clears throat> but anyway, so when we look at our hyperspectral data, which now includes common juniper, Jay Communis here, we can see that the mean spectral reflectance curves. I'm sorry, median spectral reflectance curves are pretty similar across most of the visible and shortwave infrared regions of the spectrum. The sections where the curves drop to zero here are places where we cut out regions of high water vapor absorption, which won't be useful when we shift to working with data from space. So we don't want to learn to rely on those regions of the spectrum. Um, the 95% confidence intervals mostly overlap when we look at all of the species on one plot, though we can see that in the shortwave infrared region here, um, the three conifers have lower re reflectivity than the other species. And strangely, juniper um, is more similar to the deciduous shrubs here. But we are seeing this separation between the three conifers of interest and other species in the shortwave infrared regions. It becomes easier to observe statistically significant differences where the, confident, the bootstrapped confidence intervals do not overlap. Um, so these are 95% confidence intervals that are shaded um, when we compare species two at a time. In some cases, such as with Engelmann spruce and limber pine here, the species are not statistically uh, different throughout most of the spectrum, with the exception of um, around 350 to 500 nanometers, uh, which is the only region where limber pine and Engelmann spruce diverge. So you can see that this region corresponds to only two of the worldview three bands, coastal and blue. Conversely, glandular birch and Engelmann spruce diverge in three regions of the spectrum with great enough magnitude that I don't have to zoom in for you. To make the most of this con continuous data, we used a CNN with one channel, the hyperspectral data, and in one dimension. The convolutions happen over the vectors of hyperspectral data versus over a spatial grid. The architecture of the model is similar, but there are more pooling layers because the vector was around 2100 elements long. These GIFs are a good reminder of how convolution and pooling work and generally how this was adapted to a simpler data set, but these are actually more complicated than our model because they depict three channels instead of just one. The results are very interesting. So without the constraints of low sp spatial and spectral resolution, the CNN is able to use the spectral information to separate species with fa fairly high accuracy for an A-class model at 68.9%. The CNN blows the trivial model out of the water, which could have at best achieved 18.9% accuracy, equivalent to the frequency of the most abundant class, uh, which in this case was bagel or glandular birch. Unfortunately, it looks like, as we might have predicted from the earlier figure, this model tends to confuse limber pine with Engelmann spruce. So 22% of the time when the model predicts limber pine, the sample is actually spruce, for example. Strangely enough, even though um, Aspen or Poder was not the least represented species, the models still learned to never predict it. Um, shrubby sinkfoil, on the other hand, which was our least abundant class, um, but which was in bloom at the time, was, the low, uh, was distinctive enough that the model can classify it with surprising reliability, likely due to those bright yellow flowers. Aspen apparently is similar enough to willow that it tends to get lumped into that class instead, or into um, juniper. Okay, so the permutation test was somewhat complicated for our continuous data. Uh, we partitioned the continuous data into 109 bands of 20 nanometers each, um, just for greater interpre interpretability, to get a sense for which regions of the spectrum were most important for classification. So only the top 30 predictors are shown here. 
Um, I'm looking primarily at the multi pass forward test um, for this, which is the most interpretable for this data set because we have 109 predictors, many of which are actually very informative. The single and multi pass backwards tests, where all of the variables are permuted except for one or a few, are not very helpful. Um, from the multi pass forward test, however, we can zero in on which regions of the spectrum are doing the heaviest lifting up at the top. The top predictor was 410 to 429 nanometers, which aligns with the coastal band in world view three imagery. And the next three most important predictors um, are in the short wave infrared region corresponding to world view three sphere band eight, and then two sphere regions that are unfortunately in between the eight world view three bands. Um, so the, those would not be captured. Um, 430 to 449 nanometers is another section of the coastal band and it emerges as important. Um, oh yeah, and I didn't quite have time for this webinar, but I can look at permutation test results for specific species to see which regions are help most helpful for discriminating which species. Okay, so the four class model is even more promising with a top one accuracy of 85.2% and a top two accuracy of 91.8%. We still see some confusion of limber pine and Engelmann spruce. Um, but also Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir. Um, we can see a very high confidence in separating our three conifers from the other five species. And in spite of the very narrow ranges of the spectrum that are useful for discriminating limber pine, subalpine fir, and Engelmann spruce from each other, the model manages fairly well. Looking at the results of the permutation test, the coastal band again emerges as the most important predictor, but not more important than the sphere band not covered, than a sphere band not covered by world v3 sphere data. Um, and then there are also other sphere uh, bands that stand out as useful in separating conifers from one from another and from other species, including um, regions of the shortwave infrared or sphere spectrum that include or are covered by world view three sphere bands three and four, but then also a lot of regions where world view three does not cover. The yellow and near infrared one bands also appear to be useful. So finally, we can look at the model results for the two class attempt. The accuracy jumps to 93.7% for separating limber pine from everything else. The model is somewhat overconfident. So 28% of the time when it predicts limber pine, it is actually a different species, but it is extremely good at correctly identifying when a sample is not limber pine. The bands that are most helpful for distinguishing limber pine emerge as the green and coastal bands, um, the shortwave infrared bands six and two, as well as some other regions of sphere that aren't covered by world V3. Um, and then the red and yellow world V3 bands. So the next steps are to test this by testing whether our hyperspectral data when converted to world V3 bands can still be used to discriminate species. So when we reduce the spectral resolution, can we still discriminate these species, perhaps with the aid of spectral vegetation indices? This will tell us whether high resolution multispectral data, such as that collected by a drone, can adequately discriminate species. Unfortunately, we are also somewhat limited by sample size due to the time sensitive nature of those field spectrometer collections, um, but it's still worth an attempt. Um, the field spectrometer is great when you can't get a drone into the field, as in, is the case in Rocky Mountain National Park designated wilderness, but it is difficult to implement a tree line, as I mentioned before. Um, oops. One second. <clears throat> we can also add uh, spectral vegetation indices to our spatial CNN, although the CNN is likely already picking up on patterns these indices would um, amplify. We have more work to do, but these preliminary results are very promising for future applications. Ideally, we will be able to work out how to efficiently use our data to discriminate limber pine from other species at tree line sites we haven't visited. To make this possible, I would like next like to attempt to use segmentation algorithms to separate tree line sites into objects after first masking out all non vegetation and mixed tundra, and then use our CNN to classify these objects by species. And then I can see whether or not this was successful. Um, it's important to note that a CNN, like any machine learning model, is only as useful as the data you provide to it. So while it would be worth a test, I'm guessing that even the two class model would do poorly in a system where limber pine is growing amidst completely different species without additional training data.
That said, if we build a library of spectral training data for different species, um, of course, this is considerable field work cost over time, um, we might be able to overcome this sort of hurdle in the future um, by sharing data. I've also recently discovered that the NEON aerial observation platform data is available for Rocky Mountain National Park, which would mean that I could use a combination of hyperspectral and LIDAR data to approach this problem. Um, I think it would be useful to compare the accuracies obtained with different approaches to the same problem and also report the potential costs associated with each for managers and researchers if the data isn't already available. Okay. So I had an amazing set of collaborators and field assistants who helped with this work. I was lucky to be able to collaborate with and learn from Ryan Lagerquist, who is an expert on explainable machine learning, but typically applies this knowledge to weather modeling. He also came out into the field, as you can see on the bottom right. Matt Cross and Ted Scambos provided substantial guidance on data collections with the field spectrometer, and Matt also helped substantially with obtaining imagery from Maxar. They usually work with larger clients on larger image orders. Um, Peter Antha Matten, Diana Tombach, and I co-wrote the grant that funded the imagery and a new Trimble geolocator. Oops. And of course, I had amazing people who helped me collect the data to feed the ravenous CNN. Um, Lucas Rudizel at the top left, Nicole Henestroza seen at the top right, my brothers John and Travis Sindewald, who are in the picture in the bottom left, my dad Bill Sindewald also came out, uh, and Libby Pansing and Aaron Wagner. Um, so all of that said, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laurel. That was really awesome. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand in the chat and I can um, allow you to talk. Otherwise, feel free to post questions into the chat. And we already have one here from Kathleen which you somewhat covered here at the end, but uh, Kathleen asks, would LIDAR present a better view of the situation? Did you look at either the Route National Forest or Medicine Bow National Forest? I think they have insect and disease info from aerial surveys nearly yearly. Um, that's great to know. I actually have not looked at that um, data set. I considered using LIDAR. Um, the main limitations were that we can't fly a drone in the park um, and, I wrongly assumed that LIDAR data was not available through the AOP um, data set uh, because Rocky Mountain National Park is not a NEON site, but um, it is available. So I'm interested in exploring that in the future. Thank you for the suggestion also um, of that other data set. Thank you. Hi. I'm Alina Kanzler, it says Courtney, that's my first name. I was wondering about the availability of spectral end members for other subalpine species. Are there libraries available with that spectral data more generally, or was that just something that collection was the only option? Uh. Um, yeah, great question. So um, there are not spectral libraries available for these vegetation species. That's something that I think that we could really work on in this field so that we can um, do a better job of leveraging remote sensing data, um, sort of on the, on the level of how uh, people will use um, spectral signatures of different minerals to identify places um, in the field where you might find them for uh, mineral exploration, for example. That's a great question. Thanks. And I can also um, put slides back up if there are more specific questions on things. Thank you. 
And thanks also to John Van Gundy for the posting all the information on Planet Labs. I'm I'm really excited to start working with some of their data. They didn't quite have they don't have high enough um, resol spatial resolution data for me to use on this project um, yet, but it's a great source of data for a lot of other applications. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'll read this question. Uh, have you been able to examine the atmospheric effects such as air clarity, particulate matter, relative humidity, and backscatter, uh, and their influences on targets while collecting spectral signatures at ground level? That's a great question. So I haven't examined this systematically, um, but it's definitely a concern. So when you collect the um, field spectrometer data, you're collecting reflectance data relative to a white reference, which is um, a, a perfectly level material that um, was tested in the lab and reflects uniformly close to 100% across the entire spectrum. And so you're comparing everything relative to this assumed 100% reflectivity. Um, and if you have any, like uh, there were some days, for example, when, when there was smoke that was visible in the atmosphere, um, and on these days, I um, was not able to get reliable collections because um, the smoke would cause differences in the illumination intensity in between collecting the white reference and collecting the sample. So um, often we would, we, we had probably dozens, if not um, over a hundred collections that we just couldn't use um, because of these atmospheric effects or um, more often clouds drifting over the sun. And we can only collect within four hours, um, two hours either side of solar noon, which is kind of a pain, um, <laughs> especially at treeline in July. Thanks, Laurel. And then uh, second part of that question also is uh, how close in dates were the satellite imagery and ground truth data? That's a great question. So um, the the figure that I showed, um, I so I, I still need to um, make a figure for the most recent set of ground truth data, comparing it the World V3 equivalent to um, pixels on the ground. That's going to be a little bit time consuming. The figure that I showed um, as an example, um, that was why we saw here. I'll, I can share screen again and go to that specific slide. Um, See. So if we go to that slide, here we go. Um, yeah, so the image was collected in um, on July 20th, uh, or no, July 22nd, 2020, um, whereas the spectrometer data was collected in early September, in the very first week of September. Um, so you can see there's a difference in the overall um intensity of the illumination between these two um, but that's definitely the so all of the spectrometer collections from this year uh, occurred in july and um early august thanks um and diana asks could you elaborate on tree line and climate applications yeah so <clears throat> um I think it's important to identify, um, to estimate the distribution and um, relative abundance of different, um, or the composition of different tree line communities, um, because of course, different species are going to um, respond at different rates and um, in different ways to changing climate. So we might see an increase in cone production, we might see an increase in growth, we might also see species starting to establish uh, above their current extent um, at treeline. But of course, this is going to be dependent on uh, moisture availability, for example, and drought tolerance. Limber pine is very drought tolerant, for example. Um, and the Clark's Neckcracker tends to cache near objects that aid in recall of cache sites, um, which could also act as nurse objects for limber pine. Um, and so we, we will see it um, isolated on the landscape in places where we don't see spruce and fir. Um, but of course, limber pine is extremely slow growing. So if we are relying on limber pine to um, respond um, to changing climate and advance, it's the, the tree line will probably advance at a very slow rate, for example. 
Um, so I think if we're trying to make predictions about what's going to happen with tree line systems with climate change, we really need to think about tree line systems as um, very diverse and really as multiple tree lines and do a good job of representing the species on the landscape and understanding how they are going to react to the different um, particular changes that we'll see at that, those sites. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. I do have a lot of writing to do. <laughs> a lot of fun too. Beautiful, beautiful places that I get to hang out in. I have just a quick um, kind of small technical question, I guess. Could you just expand on what the trivial model is? Yeah, so that's, um, okay, let me, let me go back to, yeah, so we have frequencies for each class. And so the trivial model is, is essentially just going to be um, drawing randomly according to these frequencies. Um, so about 28% of the time it's gonna predict ABLA. Um, and if you do enough iterations of that, then you could achieve a maximum of 28% accuracy. I see. So that's um, independent of where the ABLA is actually occurring spatially? Exactly. There's no information that's provided. It's just a completely random model. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that, good question. And I don't have the, um, the sample sizes at the individual level. I have the, the pixel sample size here. Um, the total individuals were around 700. Um, there were only, only about um, somewhere between 12 and 25 were Aspen. So that's why we see the poor model performance with Aspen. Um, of course, there are multiple pixels per individual, but the Aspen patches that we had also didn't take up a very large area. So very small sample sizes for that. And I'm sure if I continued to collect more hundreds of tree perimeters, um, the model performance would improve. I do have more data. Um, so the next steps are to include the new imagery data sets. So in September and the shortwave infrared data um, and see how that improves model performance. And then, um, Ultimately, we, we also need to um, test our best model on our testing data set. Um, so I have a testing data set within the image extent that I currently have, and I have another testing data set for um, a completely different region of the park on Flat Top Mountain. Um, and so I'll be able to um, use all of the data from the original area to train and validate the new model and then test on this completely spatially independent region. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Laurel, for your presentation. You. It was really interesting work, and we're definitely looking forward to reading more about it in your dissertation. Uh, and with that, we'll conclude this webinar, and we'll ask you to join us again on January 17th for Enzo Martelli's presentation on the ecological effects of restoration treatments on white bark pine. Awesome. Thanks so much, Glad. See you all then. All righty. Happy holidays, everyone. Stay warm. <laughs>